All right, here we go with an introduction to Buddhism. It's about 2,500 years old and started in India and spread out through Southeast Asia and then spread uh, kind of east, northeast to uh, southern China as well. Today follows uh, followed by about 300 million or so people and that's certainly spread around the the globe now. You can find them in the United States and Canada, Western Europe, etc. And of course they're based on the teachings of Buddha. So who exactly was Buddha? Uh, born Siddhartha Gautama and was basically born a Hindu. You know, Hinduism was around uh, and rolling at this time um, in northern India here. And he was uh, in the Kshatriya class, I believe. And this is 500 years before the birth of Christ to kind of help you date that, 2,500 years ago. And uh, was a wealthy guy and went off, as you uh, heard from the video or read in the uh, textbook, that, you know, he left a, a wife and, and a young child behind and uh, was, was trying to figure out uh, how, how people could be happy in the world and did some trial and error with some things and <clears throat> followed a, a strict ascetic lifestyle, meaning just trying to put off a lot of uh, luxuries, just living a very simple life to figure out what would make people happy. And he, he came up with a few, few ideas. Um, what he realizes is that just living completely, you know, just nothing hardly, you know, other than, you know, finding a way to eat, um, didn't necessarily do that. So once he had this kind of epiphany that you, you get from the, the whole story from the video and the reading, um, I'll, I'll let that share the details. He becomes the enlightened one, the awakened one, the Buddha. So, he dedicated the rest of his life to teaching others uh, some of the discoveries that he'd made in his mind about how to live a, a great life. When he became enlightened underneath that tree, he came up with four key truths, or noble truths. The first tenant of that is that all life is suffering, right? You're not going to get out of... of pain and, and problems. But he deduced that the bulk of it is is caused by this idea of wanting our desire for stuff, for things, for the latest fashions, um, our attachments to people and things like that is what causes us to have negative attitudes and feelings, etc. So, obviously, the idea is to to create happiness is to eliminate suffering and to eliminate suffering if it's caused by desire is to get rid of your desire and attachment for things okay um, and if you can do that and achieve this uh, wonderful state of uh, freedom from want that this would be called nirvana right this idea that your soul is kind of aligning with the universe and you get um, released from the cycle of rebirth. Now, if I may interject here for a second, if you recall the, the Greek philosophers of ancient Greece from that unit, if you remember the Stoics, uh, Epictetus was one of the philosophers and he had a very similar idea there. Um, his line is, freedom isn't secured by filling up on your heart's desire, but by removing your desire. Meaning that Siddhartha Gautama, or the Buddha, and Epictetus are of the same mind, you know, at approximately the same era in world history, which is, if you want happiness, there are basically two simple ways in which you can be wealthy or happy, you know, rich in terms of happiness, or maybe even monetarily, that you can try and get everything you want, or to want everything that you have right? To, to be happy and grateful with what you do have. And if you eliminate that thirst or desire for the latest iPhone or etc., cetera, um, something to think about anyway. But the Buddha said that he had an idea or a plan, an eightfold path 
to get people to this state of nirvana and, and ease that suffering and make it easier. So that Eightfold Path, obviously, uh, has a, an ability to be divided into three parts. The first is wisdom, okay? We have this idea that if you have the right understanding, meaning if you can you can become happy and eliminate desire if you believe in the this this view of existence, right? That that life is suffering and it's gonna be difficult. Um, and then the the right thought or the right motivation, the idea that uh, you buy into this idea that Buddhism is is a way for you to um, eliminate the suffering here. So those two go hand in hand. That's just being wise to the human situation, human condition. The second area uh, involves moral discipline. Okay, so we're looking at uh, right speech, which is obviously you know avoid lies, slander, and abuse. This is gonna gonna keep you out of trouble, keep you happier if you can follow those expectations. The right actions, you know, don't kill, don't steal, um, and any other improper actions, things that you know are just good general principles. And then, of course, don't be involved, don't uh, do a job, don't have an occupation in life that that um, isn't aligned with these things. And you can think about, you know, some jobs that, that aren't going to match up with these types of things, right? So pick a career that's uh, that's that's good. And then the mental discipline, uh, the sixth is the right effort, meaning you got to have a great attitude, have a great attitude towards things. Uh, right mindfulness means uh, an awareness, right? To be mindful, and that's actually kind of a, a modern trend, and, and it probably comes out of some some Buddhist practices that have have creeped in, and, and we call it mindfulness. You know, up until a couple years ago, I mean, within the last three, four years, I would argue, I've never heard of mindfulness, you know, or mindfulness coaches, but it's it's a career path, and there are classes out there, and there's mindfulness for educators, and probably a lot of other professions that there are seminars and conferences for. So, uh, probably grows out of, uh, it's not nothing new, it's uh, it's something old, so this idea that you have, have to have an aware, awareness of your your body and your feelings and your thoughts and guess what Buddha's got an answer for that and he goes the the way to develop all of these things you know how do I how do I learn to control what I say and what I do how do I gain a greater awareness of, of my feelings and and he said it's it's meditating it's having the right concentration you'll find it written as a right concentration in some books well, how do you learn to concentrate and focus on what you say and what you don't want to say and how you react uh, to when people say something offensive to you, etc.? And you meditate. So you, you see pictures, a lot of monks, a lot of Buddhists uh, meditating, you know, and in and, and other, you know, the Judaic Christian, uh, you know, that's it's prayer, right? Um, it's... A lot of these religions have these similar overlaps, but they all center around this idea of uh, this idea of taking some time to probably close your eyes and and have good self-talk, uh, maybe communicate with somebody else in that speech or yourself, and and learn to concentrate, learn to focus on becoming better and happier. So. Just to wrap up some key points on Buddhism, uh, obviously uh, the Buddha dies. Um, Buddhism, just to clarify, is non-theistic. Most Buddhists do not see him as a god or a deity. Um, however, there is a branch of Buddhism that, that does see him. And that's, again, we've talked about differences in other religions and how they branch off into different interpretations of their key texts and practices and, and uh, this is one that, that makes uh, a few branches of Buddhism exist. Just to point out a few things, there is overlap with Hinduism, you know, because of the origin. Um, both practice, you know, nonviolence as most religions and philosophies do. 
uh, reincarnation is, is a concept, and to Hindus it's called moksha, and to Buddhists it's called nirvana, the, the states of release and uh, freedom from the cycle of rebirth. It's different, however, because uh, the rejection of the caste system is strong. You know, obviously a, a prince seeking uh, freedom who had, you know, more luxury goods compared to other people at the time. Um, so this is, is inappropriate. Um, Hinduism is generally considered polytheistic, and this is a non-theistic religion. So some, some things there. You know, Buddha, his, his teachings were written uh, not in the Vedas of the Hindu Hinduist belief, but a, a book called The Three Baskets of Wisdom. And of course, they reject this concept of a Hindu priesthood. So, very simple. You can see that this, you know, simplicity helps attract a lot of people to different religions. Here you have a monastery in, in Bhutan. And again, you can see that the growth of it comes from a lot of these wonderful pr principles that are appealing to, to people seeking them. A couple of proverbs. So again, you're seeing here an emphasis probably on some of that right mindfulness or concentration or meditation, this idea that they can control or the right action, right? I think my tenth one's getting cut off, but the bottom it says uh, the tenth one is accept no gold or silver. Here you can see it's spread from India south to Sri Lanka, southeast into Asia here, and then northeast into China and beyond. And here are your two main branches of Buddhism. And again, we've broken down uh, different, you know, Judaism and Christianity and Islam all have their, their major branches as well. That wraps it up.